Now it's time for The Last Word, where Ari Melber is in for Lawrence tonight. Good evening, Ari. Good evening, Rachel. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you, my friend. Tonight, the legal pressure on Donald Trump, his family, and his network of aides, lawyers, former aides, and former fixers looks to be at an all-time high. Bob Mueller's prosecutors are now 10 days into their first trial of a former Trump aide, campaign chair Paul Manafort, who watched his case get harder this week as another Trump aide uh, who worked on the campaign, Rick Gates, was confessing to crimes on the stand. Now, for all the indictments and evidence and the general rancor of the Trump presidency, this week did mark the first time a former Trump aide ever did confess publicly to a crime. Gates telling jurors he committed felonies with Paul Manafort. That is a fact. That is news. That is legally concerning for Donald Trump and politically concerning as confessions are not a great message heading into the midterms. But Donald Trump has his own plan for midterm messaging. And while he didn't know this trial of this campaign chair would be on track for a verdict right heading into Labor Day, which is, of course, a key time for the midterms, he has long known that he has his own plan to try to divert attention towards a different political fight. In fact, he told a confidant earlier this summer he would revive his attacks on the NFL over people who kneel in protest directly leading up to the midterms because Trump believes, quote, its return to the headlines will help Republicans win votes. And there it is. Today, Donald Trump re-upping his attacks on NFL players over the kneeling. This is on a Friday, heading into the anniversary, of course, of that Charlottesville White Power rally. We're not going to read the tweet tonight from the president attacking the players in last night's game because it's not particularly newsworthy. And we're not going to show you all the headlines it sparked. You can imagine there were many of them. The actual developments, though, we are going to show you because that is what Trump is distracting from. And they include Mueller pressing this week for a wider interview with Trump than he's willing to give, which could launch a Supreme Court fight. It includes Mueller putting an associate of Roger Stone in the grand jury box just today and getting another Roger Stone aide held in contempt today for refusing to testify at all in this probe. It also includes the issuance of a new subpoena to an associate of both Stone and Julian Assange, Randy Credico, news that first broke exclusively on MSNBC Thursday night. Now, that's a lot of subpoenas and interviews of people around Roger Stone who, unlike most current White House aides, is actually someone who's worked closely, intimately with Donald Trump for many years. And those are all developments inside these investigations. When it comes to the criminal trial of Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort, prosecutors are now drawing some of the first lines in public back to the campaign, the administration, and corruption. Let's walk through this one because it's significant and it's new. Just today, a bank executive took the stand in this case to detail a $16 million loan that was provided to Paul Manafort and noting that he got suspiciously fast approval for it by going directly to the CEO, a banker who wanted to serve in the Trump administration. And Manafort went ahead and wrote an email, so it's in writing, pushing that banker for the pivotal, pivotal job of Army secretary. There are other non-NFL developments dogging Trump tonight as well. This week marks the first time we had a person in Congress who was his first congressional endorser indicted on charges of insider trading and lying to the feds. This special election this week also saw Democrats improve their support by 10 points in a district that Donald Trump carried by about 11 in the crucial state of Ohio. If those trends continue, Republicans would hold power in House races where they do hold an 11-point edge or more, which would also look like a probable loss of control of the House of Representatives. Now, right now, that Republican's about a point ahead. The race has not officially been called. So while attacking football players who protest police brutality is one way to head into this weekend, let's also note many Americans taking a different tack. And others are doing simply what many people do on sad anniversaries, honoring the people who are no longer with us, like Heather Heyer, who was killed a year ago at that white supremacy rally. And today, her mother, Susan Bro, spoke about accountability for those in politics who encourage hate and violence. I can tell you what David Duke and um, Richard Spencer and Jason Kessler and I believe Matthew Heimbach have even said, and that is that the current administration has given them the go-ahead, given them a thumbs-up, given them a wink and a nod. That's their words, not mine. 
I'm joined tonight to kick off our conversation with Mark Thompson, host of Make It Plain on Sirius XM Radio, Jonathan Alter, columnist for The Daily Beast and an MSNBC analyst and a radio host as well, and Baratunde Thurston, an author, artist, activist, uh, the book How to Be Black, uh, relevant here. Uh, and I start with you. Um, there is so much bad news following Donald Trump. Uh, there is a playbook that we know, and some people say he is president, so they will report on the tweet or the attack. Uh, your view of what is important, of what we should be focused on when you look at all this going into the weekend? I think there's two things. I think one is the reminder that when this president needs a distraction, he hits one of two big buttons, the blame immigrants button or the attack rich black athletes button, because he knows that they work. The other thing that I think the takeaway is important is the contrast. The people he's attacking are doing a better job at leading than he is. Mm. Last week, he attacked LeBron James. So our supposed leader is throwing little children in jail. LeBron James is putting them in schools. This week, he attacks NFL players for exercising the First Amendment in the Constitution when this president, on a daily basis, likely undermines that Constitution by maintaining an ownership stake openly in his businesses. Mm. He is revealing himself constantly through these. And so I think the valuable lesson to us is the high contrast that he's offering a supposed leader versus real leadership, mm. and he's threatened by the real. I, I would agree, um, you know, but this is a distraction that comes easy for someone who was the son or is the son of the heir Trump of the KKK. Donald Trump is a racist and a white supremacist and is particularly, I believe, obsessed with black men. He attacks strong black men. Um, he went after President Obama, he's going after LeBron James, he's going after NFL players because of his own inadequacies. You know, we use the term white supremacy, but that's really a projection. White supremacy is really a manifestation of a sense of inferiority. And so he feels inferior to these other people who are successful, doing positive things. Um, these men are taking a knee for non-criminals. Michael Brown, whose anniversary was yesterday, not a criminal. Tamir Rice, not a criminal. Sandra Bland, Renisha McBride, Jordan Davis, Trayvon Martin, not criminals. But as you've been reporting, as all the legal evidence is pointing to it, he is the one who is a criminal. And we know he's using this to exploit uh, the midterms. That's his goal. That's his effort. But also, let's be honest, um, he could care less himself about the national anthem. The only anthem Donald Trump cares about is the Russian national anthem. Mm. Well, and two facts for this, Jonathan. One, uh, the polling of the president's tweet attack on LeBron James, which again is a, a kind of a sad 2018 little statistic that we have these polls. But people overwhelmingly oppose uh, this. 58% of Americans saying they oppose what he said. Uh, only 12% support. Uh, the rest say they, they just didn't know about it or neither. So to the extent that it breaks through, that means there are people who are still conservative are still backing Trump, and they don't even claim to like this. Uh, and also the New Orleans State defensive end, uh, Cam Jordan, responding, saying, hey, guy who won the presidential election, how about we get a statement on the, quote, Unite the Right rally being held in D.C. this week and a year after the first one in Charlottesville? Uh, to to Baratunde's point, some of these athletes, who obviously, many of whom are black, uh, are very clear about what the connection they see on this Friday going into this weekend when someone was killed uh, at a white supremacy event, and, and here we're about to go back all into it all this weekend. Well, professional sports, at least football and basketball, are now lined up in unison against the president of the United States. We have never seen anything like that. These are our heroes. And so Trump is taking a real gamble here. I'm not sure uh, that it's going to work out for him. I'm not sure that those rural voters who did not show up in Ohio on Tuesday night, his base, I'm not sure that if he demagogues more on this, that they're somehow going to get uh, off their rumps and go vote. The people who voted were the people who are disgusted by this, and that's why that 10-point uh, victory that he had in 2016 was erased in Ohio. So, you know, you passed over almost without comment because we're so used to it. Oh, he's doing this for political reasons. Think about that. That is the definition of demagoguery, mm -hmm. is, is to use race and fear for political reasons. We know the players are standing up. Will the fans stand up? So uh, I have some friends who are very distinguished anthropologists. They were among the older guys who originated the teach-ins in the 1960s uh, against uh, the Vietnam War. They're trying to organize 
kneeling ins. Mm -hmm. They want fans at college football games, mm -hmm. young people, to kneel in solidarity with the players when they're in the stands. We'll see whether that kind of thing happens. But I think Trump is assuming that there's not going to be pushback, and I'm not sure, so sure he's right this fall. I uh, think it's sad the smallness of his game plan for this electioneering, for this possible blue wave that's coming, that the only play he has left is more racism, more division, because he's turned away any potential moderates who might come to his aid. And it doesn't have to be that way. Other presidents haven't done it this way, but this guy is going for the darker path, for the uglier path, and it's just a waste of presidential power. If he were killing it as president, I would get it. Tweet about the NFL all day, every day. That's your side time job. But there's real work to do. And you were hired by us, the people. You were paid by us, the people. This is a big job. And he's flaunting and flittering away the real opportunity he has to actually lead. When he's given that opportunity, he goes low every time. And Jonathan, how much of that runs into uh, the collective toll that corruption takes here? Uh, because there are people who may say, well, I never thought Donald Trump was going to drain the swamp. I always thought it was crap. And I'm not going to vote for him or the Republicans. That's sort of a, a sitting voting block. Uh, but as, as we all know, the where midterms and turnout and all these things matter is everyone else. And is there a one, two, three, five, seven point shift eventually when enough of the corruption stories congeal to say, wow, the thing that he ran against, the swamp, the pay for play, the Clinton Foundation, um, to echo uh, uh, the, the point Mark was making in a different context, it was all projection of their own problems. So it's really interesting. I talked to a Democratic candidate in an Ohio district, not the one on Tuesday, uh, a, a very conservative district. This guy has a chance. And months ago, he was telling me there was only one issue in his district, health care, health care, health care, and focusing on uh, people with pre-existing conditions who would lose their protections if the Democrats uh, 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 were not to get control of the House. That's all they cared about. When I talked to him last week, he said corruption mm. is coming as an issue, that these people in power are swamp creatures. And this would mean the Democrats have a potential to turn, drain the swamp on its head so that the swamp that needs to be drained now is the Trump swamp. And they have a lot to work with on an almost daily basis. I mean, you have this congressman who's inside insider trading from the South Lawn of mm -hmm. the White House, right, right. caught on camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, the and, White House is a crime scene. Right. <laughs> you know, and every day, then you have the, the, the uh, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, there's a story in Forbes magazine, not exactly a liberal rag, saying that he was a grifter to the tune of $120 million. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so these are, you know, bad actors in this Trump uh, orbit. And I think collectively it's really going to hurt. And, and we should add you, you, the reporting here also about Devin Nunes. I mean, that is an example of corruption. They are now, it, he's on record saying that they're going to try to do all they can to protect him and cover this up. We don't have to plot. None of us has to plot on behalf of each other to cover up something because we haven't done anything. We haven't committed any crime. No crime has been committed. I don't have to cover you up if you've not done anything wrong. So to me, that's an admission that they know he's in trouble. Um, I think corruption is important to, to run on. I think it's important to continue to expose, even if it weren't a political season, um, because um, even as Rachel just reported, the tampering in the elections is still going on. Donald Trump is the one hmm. that is unpatriotic, not these NFL players, not, any, not anybody taking it. It has nothing to do with the flag or the anthem. They are taking a knee because of injustice, the very same injustice that happened to Heather Heyer hmm. a year ago. She is, as I've said before, the Viola Luzo of our generation. Viola Luzo, for those who don't know, a white woman killed during the march from Selma to Montgomery, uh, simply driving people to and from the march. Um, I met her family and know her family. Her, they, she lost her life standing up for what's right. Heather Heyer was doing the same thing. It's a shame that she should be gone. And Donald Trump, every day that he doesn't decry that, every day that he dismisses it and creates this false equivalency, many sides, both sides do it, it continues to set us back. He is, he is a danger. And honestly, Barry Tunde, I don't expect anything great of it. You said it's small. He's a small man. He's yeah. small-minded. Yeah. And, and he has nothing in common with the integrity of these NFL players other than that helmet of a hairdo he wears on his head.
as they as they say uh, in court. I love the helmet and the hairdo. Listen, the the contradictions are disappointing. You know, we have the White House as a crime scene. I want to remind us as well that the rhetoric that comes from this White House and indeed this party in power is one of law and order. Right. Law and order. Let's vilify immigrants who right. commit less crime than actual citizens because of law and order. Let's trash athletes because of law and order. Let's talk trash about the inner city because of law and order. Yet these same people are willing to at best look the other way when law and order is being so absolutely undermined by people who have the power to stop it and who themselves are committing it. Right, and that I think dovetails with the question in midterms that we were discussing about, which is corruption. what does corruption look like yeah. and what does it look like when Bob Mueller says people are defrauding in the United States? That's what the charges are. They have to be proven, but yep. it is, it's a wallop. Uh, my special thanks to Mark Thompson, Jonathan Alter, and Baratunde Thurston for this discussion. Coming up, are the president's TV lawyers playing around about this interview with special counsel Mueller? Today, Rudy Giuliani and Jay Sekulow filled in for Sean Hannity while the president dropped more tweet bombs on Bob Mueller. Also, some of America's immigration judges are now in a kind of actual accountability mechanism against Jeff Sessions. We'll explain why it matters. Could a judge hold the country's own top law enforcement official in contempt of court? It is rare for grand jury witnesses to actually be held in contempt because if you get a grand jury subpoena, you have to talk. The authorities tell you that. Your lawyer will tell you that if you ask them. And the last time a witness even claimed they might defy Bob Mueller's grand jury subpoena, well, that was Sam Nunberg. It made big news, but he said that once he grasped the consequences of being held in contempt and going to jail, he would talk. So today's news is important. It is the first time a federal judge has actually went ahead and found a witness in contempt in the Mueller grand jury. The witness, former Roger Stone aide Andrew Miller, who's repeatedly fought this required interview. Now, to be clear and fair, this does not mean that Miller's definitely doing something wrong yet. Unlike Sam Nunberg, Miller is not just claiming he will defy the subpoena out of the blue. He is authorizing his lawyers to take this position and use the new contempt ruling in order to file an appeal in court. And they say their goal is to get a different judge who they hope will find that Mueller's entire probe is illegitimate. In order to appeal Judge Howell's decision challenging the constitutionality of the special counsel, we have to have a contempt order in order to go to the Court of Appeals. This case is likely to end up in the United States Supreme Court. So that's one thing that happened today. Meanwhile, there's action at Paul Manafort's trial, but it took a turn towards the mysterious. Today was going to be the day Mueller's prosecutors rested their case. Then the judge did something pretty unusual with no explanation. He halted the trial for hours. Then Mueller's team called ahead a bank executive who testified that Manafort was trying to sell a job in the Trump administration. As we just mentioned in the top of the show, this is big. This is the first corruption allegation in the trial that does implicate that future Trump administration though there was no claim today that Trump knew about this offer. Now, while that evidence was making its way through federal court, what was Donald Trump's legal team doing? Were they analyzing every hour of these transcripts or working on a factual rebuttal to what came out in the Manafort case today? Or were they talking to legal experts or journalists about the facts? No. They spent three hours co-guest hosting for Sean Hannity on his radio show, taking live calls and blasting the Mueller probe. If you look at the scope and nature of this inquiry, the way it started, the corruption at the outset. It surely looks like an illegitimate investigation. The President of the United States said this a long time back, that it's a witch hunt. Giuliani telling Trump supporters the probe is illegitimate while still claiming he might offer Trump up for a limited interview with this allegedly illegitimate process, which doesn't really make sense. Now, the wrangling over that interview could reach the Supreme Court, but for that to happen, Mueller would have to decide that these negotiations are effectively exhausted, that it's time to issue a subpoena, which the White House could then legally appeal. Some legal experts say it's clear that time has now come. Former prosecutor Harry Littman says it's time to subpoena the president. Mueller has been extraordinarily deferential and patient while Trump and his representatives engaged in their scarcely credible gamesmanship. That is from Littman's brand new Washington Post piece. And he joins me, along with former federal prosecutor Joyce Vance, an MSNBC analyst. Uh, Harry, why now? Well, I mean, it could have been a few months before, but, but why now? Because uh, no time like the present. 
Things are dragging along. It's quite clear that the whole uh, back and forth uh, doesn't is not really going to end in any kind of fruitful uh, process where Trump really sits down. And so it's the only option for getting answers. And we need answers not just for the criminal probe itself, but really for the public record. We're looking at the possibility of terminating this whole thing and never having heard from the president of the United States about what happened. And I think as a matter of sort of public's right to know, that's a terrible prospect. Uh, Joyce, we like to chop it up here in good faith debates. If Harry is right, then Mueller is wrong uh, because he clearly has not made this move yet. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, well, because he hasn't. Uh, so, Joyce, what is Mueller's yeah. thinking in either trying to actually exhaust the negotiations or create a record and a public uh, image, if you will, that shows how far they went to try to do something other than issue the subpoena? Everything that Harry says really makes sense to me, including this need for a public record. You know, no other employee at the Justice Department or in government could get away with avoiding an interview. But there's one problem here, and that's the Department of Justice's policy that says that you can't indict a sitting president. And so it seems very unlikely to me that the president is formally a target of the Mueller investigation, but he has this quasi-target status. There's this thought that perhaps after he leaves the presidency, he could be indicted. And so I think Mueller will be very reluctant to part company with typical rules that say that you don't subpoena a target except under exceptional circumstances. And he'll continue this back and forth to try to get a voluntary interview. It's also worth noting that everything that we're hearing about the back and forth comes from Giuliani. You know, Mueller's not going mm -hmm. out giving press conferences. So we have to rely on, on Rudy Giuliani's narrative here. But if there is, in fact, this back and forth, then Mueller in many ways benefits by the public nature of this narrative. If on the one hand, Giuliani is building a public narrative so people won't come forth and, and deluge their representatives on the Hill with request for impeachment because they believe the process isn't fair, well, Mueller similarly benefits from mm. the sunshine effect of the public watching the president trying to dodge an interview that no one else in public life would be able to dodge. Mm. Uh, Harry, the other piece is the Giuliani claiming this is all some kind of trap. Uh, take a listen. I think what we have to get clear is the fact that a lot of people interpret it this way. Well, if he's telling the truth, why wouldn't he just go in and testify? Hey, welcome to the real world. The fact is, he is telling the truth. We're walking him into a possible perjury trap not because he isn't telling the truth, but because somebody else isn't telling the truth who they would credit, namely Comey. Uh, Harry, are you familiar with the term uh, trap house? Uh, no, go ahead. Well, it can refer to a place where there's contraband or, or criminal drug activity. Yeah. Uh, Rudy's argument seems to be that there's this sort of a perjury trap house uh, and you shouldn't let your client walk into it. What is, what is wrong with, in your view, that argument? Wow, quite a bit. So first of all, it's never been clear what they've meant. It's been kind of a, a slogan like fake news or drain the swamp by perjury trap. But just yesterday, Giuliani made clear what he what he meant, including in this interview. He said, look, there are questions like, why did you fire Comey? That is not a perjury trap question. That's a straightforward question that we need to know. That's exactly mm. the sort of thing that a prosecutor would be asking. The things he's um, posing as paradigms are exactly the down the middle questions that Mueller and the people have every right to know. A perjury trap, if it means anything, would be some kind of gotcha exercise where the president is caught unawares. You mm -hmm. can't be caught unawares by a question like, why did you fire Comey? And contrary to what he says, we don't know the answer to that because he's given seven or eight different well, ones. Well, he seemed, he seemed a little caught unawares when Lester Holt asked him it, and he admitted to a part of the intent standard of obstruction. Right. Now, is that, is that in fact the standard of record? He since has backed off from that. That, what, what, the one thing that isn't is a perjury trap. That is a legitimate question for investigation. Now, he's scared of the question because Mueller knows things that he doesn't know, but that's the position of the prosecutor. So he'll ask questions, and uh, he could be, quote-unquote, trapped into saying something false 
Not a perjury trap. That's just standard uh, questions from a prosecutor. Right. Not a perjury. Not a perjury trap house. Just straightforward questions. Right. Uh, right. Joyce, uh, finally on Roger Stone, so many of his aides being pulled into this. Do you see a possibility where this is all double checking things and no charges ultimately come? Or is any client seeing this many aides brought into the grand jury room that work for him going to be uh, fairly, fairly nervous? Anything's possible, but Stone is surrounded by a whirlwind of grand jury activity. And it looked earlier this week as though in, in talking with the woman in New York, the so-called Manhattan Madam, that something interesting happened in that interview and that they immediately took her into the grand jury to lock down her testimony, to get her to repeat whatever she told them that was so interesting under oath. So one suspects that the only real question with Stone at this point is not, will he be indicted? It's when will he be indicted? Mm. Uh, Joyce Great. Vance and Harry Lippman, a very uh, illuminating conversation. We, we benefit from your legal expertise so much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Up next, there are some immigration judges who say the DOJ under Sessions is doling out punishments if they don't deport asylum seekers fast enough. Now, one of those judges who says it's time to fight back joins us next. This is an important story on developments in law in the Trump era. There are judges now across the country who are fighting back against the way this administration has cracked down on immigration while also failing to come up with a solution to the family reunification problems it caused. Now, it's been over two weeks since a federal judge ordered the Trump administration to reunite all of the 2,500 migrant children separated from their parents. Now. The good news is most have been reunited, but 559 remain in government custody, and 365 parents of those children have been deported, which is itself an ongoing humanitarian crisis. Now, on Thursday, a federal district court judge voiced outrage when discovering that the Trump administration was deporting a mother and daughter while their court hearing was still happening. And this was a highly unusual move, the judge demanding the plane turn around and bring them back to the U.S. and threatening to hold the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, in contempt, something we were discussing in a different context earlier tonight. Now, those two people seeking asylum were basically trying to escape what they call gang violence from El Salvador, and that's part of a lawsuit that has been filed by the ACLU that challenges the way that Sessions has excluded people who are fleeing gang violence from getting asylum. Meanwhile, the union that represents 350 immigration judges in our country is pushing back against pressure from the Trump administration to try to speed up these deportations. This is something called the National Association of Immigration Judges, and they did something important. They filed a grievance against Jeff Sessions' DOJ. This was on Wednesday when it began, because it occurred after there was a DOJ replacement of a Philadelphia judge who was delaying the deportation of this young undocumented immigrant from Guatemala. Now, this judge's union is basically arguing that the DOJ is overstepping its authority and undermining a key, key concept, judicial independence. I'm pleased to say that I am joined now by Judge Dana Lay Marks, President Emeritus of the National Association of Immigration Judges. She's practiced immigration law for 41 years in San Francisco. Uh, Judge, thank you for making time to walk us through this tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Ari. It's a complicated issue. Uh, it is, and one that is important, and that uh, you and your colleagues have argued has both a legal due process dimension and a moral dimension. So for people who are following this and saying, what does this mean uh, that judges are kind of pushing back against what Jeff Sessions and the Trump administration are doing, uh, how does that work and what are you trying to achieve? People have to remember that the immigration judges in the United States are administrative judges, which is a distinction that means we work within the Department of Justice. Unlike most judges, that means that we have a boss, Attorney General Sessions. Congress sets the laws, but many of the policies that are implemented are established through the Attorney General and directives that he or she makes. But Immigration judges are the trial-level judges who decide whether or not someone is actually in the country illegally, and if so, whether that person is entitled to some kind of benefit, such as asylum. So we need a guarantee of judicial independence, of decisional independence, so that we can be sure that political pressures are not affecting the way that judges are allowed 
to carry out their role. And recently, we have felt additional encroachments on our ability to do our job as judges. And that's what brought us to this very unusual step of choosing to take an individual's case, a, a labor union grievance for a sitting immigration judge, and for our association to join with this judge and to publicly release what the grievance is right. in order to help highlight how our so, yeah. decisional independence is just being to, encroached upon. Just to pause on that, because you're, you're running through a lot of important stuff, uh, is it fair to say that your organization has taken this, as you put it, unusual step because of your view of how extreme the Jeff Sessions encroachment has been on what would otherwise be uh, your authority to handle these cases? That is accurate, but I want to make it clear as well that we are not a partisan organization. Mm -hmm. We are a professional association, and we have had criticisms of encroachment on our independence in different ways, smaller ways, by several administrations, both Democratic and Republican. And we have pushed back, but not quite as dramatically as we're doing now. Do you believe, or have evidence to support the belief, uh, that the administration uh, doesn't really want to solve the remaining cases, that part of the problem is that while they've been ordered to fix the problem they created, there is still some lack of desire or commitment to reuniting all the families. The evidence that might exist to support that argument is the fact that since the Department of Homeland Security has been created about 15 years ago, the budget for the Department of Homeland Security rose by 400 percent, and yet the budget for the immigration court was only increased by 72 percent. That really becomes dramatic when you realize that we were under-resourced at the beginning. So it has allowed a tremendous backlog of over 730,000 cases pending before a core of just 350 immigration judges, which is an overwhelming and inappropriate amount of cases for any judge to be expected to handle in an effective and efficient way. That could be, if one wants to be uh, cynical, uh, planned. Mm. Or it could just be inadvertence. One of the reasons why we've argued that we should not be in the Department of Justice is that the primary goal and role of the Department of Justice is law enforcement. And it's a premier law enforcement agency that we're very proud of. But that said, that's not necessarily the place for a neutral immigration tribunal which is what we are. So we feel that our mission no longer fits within the context of the Department of Justice, and we've urged Congress to take us out of the Department of Justice mm -hmm. and make us a separate organization that doesn't have a law enforcement boss at its head. Uh, you have given us a primer here on some of the most important issues, including the separation of powers, the role of these adjudications within the Justice Department, and the larger question that, uh, that I think America continues to debate, which is, is immigration really as simple as building a wall and deporting people? Or is there this much larger process that requires both due process and humanity? Uh, and so, Judge Marks, I appreciate you spending time with us tonight. Thank you so much, Ari. Thank you. I appreciate your allowing me. Of course. Now, coming up, we turn to some politics, including Republicans, now saying to save the GOP, you have to actually vote against Republicans in the House. Very interesting. We'll explain. That's next. As several of our experts were explaining earlier this hour, President Trump is deliberately pivoting back to a culture war by attacking NFL players who take a knee for the national anthem. And we know from a report back in May that Trump has told close associates he believes the NFL protests are, quote, a winning strong issue for him that give voters a reason to support his party in the midterms. So that's one view. But there is a very, very prominent Republican who thinks this whole approach could actually push potential Republican voters towards the Democrats. And that is the former chief speechwriter for President George W. Bush, arguing today, quote, the only way to save the GOP is to defeat it. And he calls on his fellow Republicans to use this midterm election to back Democrats in House races, even if they don't agree with Democrats on everything. And this speechwriter, Michael Gerson, says this is bigger than any one policy, because if Republicans retain control of the House in November, Trump will have proved the electoral value of racial and ethnic stereotyping. And that 
will make things much worse than they even are today, he argues. Quote, the GOP will be fully committed to a 2020 campaign conducted in the spirit of George Wallace, a campaign of racial division, urban-rural division, religious division, and party division that metastasizes into mutual contempt. That's a lot. And notice that Gerson, a Republican, is arguing real politic here. He's not appealing to everyone's better angels. He's simply stating that ethical and moral Republican voters now, in this midterm, have a role to play in providing some kind of public electoral punishment for race baiting. And that only that can provide a check on their party as it itself chooses their strategy going forward. The reference to George Wallace is, of course, as stark as it is depressing. Gerson, a Republican, acknowledging that in his view, the current GOP could actually fully become a party of quote-unquote segregation, because that, of course, is what Wallace formally stood for and ran on. Rarely does a prominent member of the Republican Party go this far, warning his own party's future could be headed for the past in every sense of the word. It's an important part of this discussion, and our panel joins me on all the implications next. Today, former President George W. Bush's top speechwriter penned an op-ed in The Washington Post that urges Republicans to do something unusual, vote for Democrats to take the House in November as the only remaining way to actually save the Republican Party from itself. That provocative headline is something, but Gerson's not alone. There are actually, of course, many former top-ranking GOP officials who've come out against their own party and urge voters to support Democrats in November. Many of them you even see on your TV screens. Joining me now is Evan McMullen, a former presidential independent candidate and CIA operative, uh, joining us live from Iowa, and Jonathan Alter back with us. Uh, Evan, you are someone who uh, tried in your own way to take on the Trump drift. Uh, and you lost, uh, and a lot of other people lost. Uh, how do you view what people like Gerson and other Republican leaders are doing, and is it the right way to do it? Yeah, well, look, I think a lot of people are saying a, a similar version of this, whether it's Steve Schmidt or Gerson or others. Uh, look, I'm, I'm also of the opinion that if we have a party in control of the House of Representatives, let's take just that one chamber uh, for a moment, uh, that will not fulfill its constitutional responsibility to exercise uh, oversight and constraint of the executive branch, uh, and, and even goes beyond that and uses its power in that chamber to erode the rule of law and to protect a president that is clearly corrupt and has encouraged a foreign adversary to intervene in our electoral process. I mean, if, if a party in control of the, the, the House chamber can't even oppose that, well then, yes, they don't deserve to be in control of the chamber. And so, and so we need to make a change there. Uh, I do hope, though, that a, a handful of moderate Republicans will survive this. Why? Because uh, I, I don't think it's right for us in this two-party system, which it is for now. Uh, I don't think it's right for us to give up on either party. But I do think that regardless of whether the Republicans stay uh, in control of the House or lose the House, we are looking at a Republican Party that will, over time now, uh, shrink and become more extreme and more loyal to Donald Trump as long as he's in power. And once he goes, I still think the party is headed down, has gone further, far enough, far enough down a path of Trumpism and sort of white nationalism and, uh, and the like that, that I don't expect it to come back soon. And I, I do believe that the only way for it to come back is to suffer the consequences of that movement. Um, but I do hope still, and you know, that there are some moderate voices that, that remain to hopefully maybe a decade down the road or a decade and a half uh, turn the party around. Yeah, and as you know, Jonathan, uh, 15 years is a good amount of time to wait for progress in politics. Um, all, all depression aside, though, uh, you know, for people who are looking at this, do, do the Michael Gersons of the world hit it right? Is it more powerful to simply leave the party? Um, do you need a challenge to Trump uh, from within the party? Um, or or do, you, do you have people like Paul Ryan who've, who've shown where they're headed and that uh, tells Republican voters it's Trump's party now? Well, they can say that, but if, if there's a thumping this fall, then there's gonna be a reckoning 
you know, in late November. Mm -hmm. And why not be part of a movement to resist the hijacking of their party? You know, we've talked a lot about how democracy and our democratic traditions, our institutions are on the line in November. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if the Republicans hold the House, Trump will be so emboldened that what we've seen so far will look like patty cake mm -hmm. in terms of his assault on our institutions. But it's also uh, kind of game on for the future of the Republican Party because he will complete his hijacking, complete his hostile takeover of that party. And remember, this is the party of Lincoln. This is the party of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And they are turning from the party that freed the slaves to the party of white nationalism. There's, there's still a chance to prevent that from happening, but that has to start now. And, and so and if Evan, you're a serious Republican, you have to vote Democratic this fall. And so, Evan, being out in Iowa and, and having been on the Hustings yourself, how much of this conversation is the grassroots conversation, or is this, again, one of those times, as we have so often in politics, where the national or quote-unquote elite conversation is different from people thinking about jobs and health care uh, on the ground? Yeah, well, look, that's people are thinking about pocketbook issues and economic issues. And, you know, they're focused on their families and getting their kids through school and to school and, and all of that. That's uh, that's true. But but I do want to comment on something that Jonathan said. Uh, you know, I, I I don't look at this, the, the Republican Party. I, I don't think it's it, it's not quite fair to say that this is the Republican or this is the party of Lincoln. It once was the party of Lincoln. Yeah, once um, was. But, but, yeah. but yeah, once was. And I know Jonathan, Jonathan I've had, and I've had many discussions. I don't think he, he disagrees with, the sen with these sentiments necessarily. But, you know, the, the party was the party of Lincoln early on. But, uh, but then ultimately the party decided uh, in the last century to pursue what was called the Southern strategy, which by its own ex explicit definition uh, was a strategy to win over remaining Southern racists. And, and I say remaining because not everyone in the South is a racist, obviously. But the party, the Republican Party, wanted to win over the votes of the remaining uh, racists in the South as the Democrats embraced the civil rights movement. And they, the Republicans wanted to do it in a way that would not turn off moderate Republicans, traditional Republican, Lincolnian Republicans. And so that's what they did. They pursued the strategy and they brought in all these, these racists. And, and the party has not been the same ever since. And, and we, the Republican Party, I'll say, has been on a, a path uh, since then that has led to where we are now. And so where I differ with maybe the way Jonathan explained it a little bit was that this was not a hijacking by Donald Trump. The party has been on this path for a yes. while, and it's going to take a while to get it back. But let's just look at one issue, immigration. So until very recently, the Republican Party, for all the racism that you rightly point to uh, in the not-so-distant past, they were pretty good on immigration. Both Bushes were uh, for comprehensive immigration reform. They were not a white nationalist party even five years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that Donald Trump has done a lot to accelerate. Uh, Evan and Jonathan, thank you both. Tonight's last word is up next. Mm -hmm. If it's 2018, our late night comedic friends have plenty to work with, and here's what they're up to for the last word. I am sure that Rudy Giuliani spends big chunks of his days chain smoking cigarettes, white knuckling it, just hoping that another tweet doesn't show up. Well, of course he's white knuckling it. If his knuckles were any other color, Trump wouldn't have hired him. <laughs> Shortly after it aired, Giuliani tweeted, there is a moron on Fox claiming I chain smoke cigarettes worrying about the president's tweets. Don't smoke cigarettes. <laughs> sir, sir, you had me at there is a moron on Fox. And that is tonight's last word. Now, if you're looking for me, you can always... Catch us at 6 p.m. Eastern on The Beat. On Monday, I'll be joined by Richard Painter, Malcolm Nance, and former Mafia prosecutor Kathy Fleming. 
Hey, it's Chris Hayes from MSNBC. You know, every day I come to the office and we make a television show. And every day I think to myself, there's so much more I want to talk about. And so this is our podcast. It's called Why Is This Happening? And the whole idea behind it is to get to the root of the things that we see play out every day. They're driven by big ideas. Each week, I sit down with a person uniquely suited to explain why this is happening. New episodes of Why Is This Happening every Tuesday. Listen for free wherever you get your podcasts.